The first time I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey, I was gone by the intermission. You can blame the beast in my pants. My date that night hated the monkeys, hated the noise they made, and then couldn't figure out why spaceships were dancing with each other in the sky. After the astronauts had their secret chat in the space pod, we went to the John and never returned. I don't get it, let's go get ice cream, she said, and certain promises in her eyelashes sent me out the door with her. I went to see it again the next night by myself. I had to borrow a couple bucks from my dad. Promised him yard work. This time I stayed in my seat during the intermission. The movie theater was very quiet, and half the couples didn't come back. That was fine by me. All their whispers and candy wrappers drove me nuts. I never experienced anything like 2001 A Space Odyssey ever again. It was holy. It was a religious experience. Don't get me wrong, I liked space movies as much as the next guy. And before the Kubrick film, I still wobbled under the impression that Planet of the Apes was the greatest science fiction movie I'd ever seen. It wasn't. The shock of seeing Lady Liberty at the end was nothing compared to the sublimity of nearly every scene in 2001. Ten years later, they had a special showing. I was a little smarter by that time. College educated, you might say. Full of ideas and looking for work. A couple children poorer, a small house richer. I didn't take my wife to see it. I didn't take a friend. I just took myself, like in the old days, when I had the freedom to do that sort of thing whenever I wanted to. I was feeling low the month before it made it back to the screens. Maybe that was part of it. Or maybe it was that I had just witnessed my third kid's first steps and the way his soft, grasping fingers reached for everything. Our monkey men ancestors in the opening act of the film suddenly made sense to me in a way they never had before. I used to think Kubrick was just being Kubrick, but he wasn't. He was tapping into something. 2001 A Space Odyssey was about the birth of knowledge, and how that birth takes place again and again at the moment we humans reach the limits of our current state and evolution. The black monolith is the key, as if that wasn't obvious even to my girlfriend in 68. But it wasn't the key to extraterrestrial life. Aliens are the MacGuffin. No, the monolith was the key to our ancestors' first thoughts. The terror those monkeys felt at waking up to find the monolith in their front yard activated synapses in their brains. Awareness of a new unknown created Wittgenstein's need for communication. All of nature had been known to them prior to this moment. Up to that point, they had 100% knowledge. There was no mystery. Nothing lay beneath the surface, because nothing existed beneath the surface until that moment. That's why Kubrick spent so long showing us their repetitive daily lives. Nothing new ever happened, nothing that needed explanation anyway. But the monkey who was sitting in the bones shortly after the appearance of the monolith, he recognized something. He recognized in the shape of that bone, the shape of the monolith. He tried to make it stand. The bone fell over several times. But the last time it fell, it disturbed the other bones. Tossing the bone again and again, he made connections, felt it in his grasp, activated his will to use the bone as a tool. The monolith, through some synapse, had caused the monkey to recognize an analogy. It gave birth to the first metaphor. This bone is this monolith. The monolith bone. Metaphorical thought and a burst of new synapses. Thoughtlessness returns as it actively beats at the bones. But then the next thought happens when he hits the skull and a flame flares up in that dark cave beneath his scalp. This bone is this monolith is this tool and it can destroy monkey heads. And as brilliant as that moment is, it's what happened next that gave birth to all of humanity. He communicated the use of that tool to his tribe, and they learned from him. Naturally, this first tool is a weapon. Their own task in life was survival. Kill or die. Kill to eat, kill to drink, kill to keep the younglings alive. No malice, only the continuation of life via the obliteration of life. Thought and the transmission of thought. All because a monkey made a metaphor. In the film, the monolith appears only when man has reached the furthest stage of his evolution, a stage no creature can ever recognize, because to evolve is to invite death to sit down at the dining room table. To evolve is to discover that the apex of the mountain is merely the foot of another mountain. The discovery of a monolith buried on the moon is not the discovery of extraterrestrials. It's the discovery that mankind has gone as far as they can with science, with society, with human life. That there is nothing new left to communicate. That stagnation is no longer sufficient to perpetuate the species. And so five men are sent to Jupiter, following the trail of the monolith's radio signal in the hopes of meeting whoever stuck that thing in the surface of the moon. It's also no accident that HAL is designed to look like the monolith. 
Hal's all-seeing eye even resembles the sun, so prominent in the first act of the film, the only source of illumination in space. The sun is myth's true first metaphor. When Kubrick cuts to a close-up of the greatest technological achievement of man, we see the sun deep in the red eye of the monolith. Metaphor, that prime proof of genius, is in the monolith. What happens to Dave, his partner, and the other three men ultimately doesn't matter. Nobody wept for the first monkeys who slaughtered each other. What happens with the mission doesn't matter. A ship lost at sea is soon forgotten by time. Dave's odyssey began after the Trojan War with Hal was won, but like Ulysses, it's going to be a long time before he gets home. His journey through the miasma of quantum whatever dazzled the seafarer just as the first sight of home dazzles. And when he arrives in a Baroque room, where the transfer of consciousness from young Dave to middle-aged Dave to old Dave to decrepit Dave happened in cuts of forgetfulness, as if he had eaten the lotus without realizing it, he found that he had no reason to speak, no reason to communicate, no reason to do anything other than the minimum necessary to survive. The perfect symmetry of Kubrick's shots was present in the narrative as well, and a chill still runs down my spine when the monolith appears at the foot of his bed, activating synapses he didn't know existed, leading him to a last transfer of consciousness into a space baby that hovered above the Earth, ready to feast on it as a babe at the breast. The mystery at the heart of 2001 A Space Odyssey is not, what does it mean? The mystery at the heart of the film is, when will we stumble upon the next stage of our mind's evolution? Kubrick seems to have faith that it will happen, but it's unlikely he believes that mankind will discover its next monolith anytime soon. If I rarely give a film all seven of my children, it's because 2001 A Space Odyssey is the pinnacle that few films can reach. I humbly, and with great trembling, present all seven of my children to this film, as well as my future, my past, and this my screaming present.